Thank you. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for, for having me. Um, I guess, first of all, uh, I suppose I better ask the question, and maybe uh, a few more um, in the room do know. Um, but uh, has everybody heard of Abloy? Does everybody know who Abloy are? Um, so if you don't, uh, Abloy is a Finnish locking company. We're part of the Asa Abloy group. So if you don't know Abloy, certainly from a UK perspective, brands that you will recognise would be the likes of Yale, uh, Chubb, uh, Multilock, Asa, Tracker. All of these companies around the world belong to a single group, and that group is, is Asa Abloy. Um, they're by far and by large the, 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 the leading and the biggest uh, locking and opening solutions manufacturer in the world. So my name is Pip Porku, and I head up uh, technical and product for Abloy in the UK. And Abloy is part of uh, the Asa Abloy group. The, the, the bit that we are most known for, um, certainly, um, would be the, the critical infrastructure protection, the high security uh, applications. A couple of colleagues of mine in the room, we've got Cassie and, and Rob here, who from our critical infrastructure team are our communications uh, sector specialists. So if you do ask me any awkward questions, I might chuck them back out into the uh, into the audience, and I guess if it, you know, if I want to, you to take away anything from today in terms of, of Abloy. My when I, I started at Abloy 17 years ago, I'd never heard of them either. For those of you in the room that have heard of Abloy, um, and I said to a colleague, I was working for an access control company at the time, and I said to a colleague, this job opportunity has come up, a place called Abloy, never heard of it, and he said to me, that's the Rolls Royce of locks. Um, so if there's if there's something you can take away, it's that uh, we do uh, very good uh, locks. And our marketing department has a bit of a flair for a dramatic video, which uh, you'll see uh, as I go through the, the slides. Um, we are, uh, as I say, uh, around the world, uniquely positioned within the, the infrastructure space. And infrastructure as a sector, or critical infrastructure as a sector, does certainly pose some interesting challenges um, from a security standpoint. Firstly, the, the most obvious is it's, it's typically large geographically spread out um, access control requirements and the vast majority of the security industry the value in the security industry is within the built environment it's about controlling the flow of people around the built environment and there's, 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 there's a huge number of different ways you can you can manage identities and manage access um, in a building it's actually quite straightforward um, in a building when you get out into infrastructure whether that's water telecoms transportation energy nuclear um, it becomes uh, increasingly more challenging because of these, these large geographic areas that you've got to manage. And, and as we've, we've just heard, um, keys. Keys have certainly been the, um, the historical way, the legacy way, uh, and sometimes the only way of, of achieving a large geographically spread out security system. So I'm going to start off by going through some examples from around uh, the infrastructure space that we work in in the UK, um, some of the challenges that we've had to solve over the years, um, and then take you through what we call our key evolution, um, which is the, the future of this sort of infrastructure based uh, geographically dispersed access control. So, key control, key control is the number one problem. And we've just heard if somebody leaves the organisation, they leave with a great big bunch of keys. Um, this, this happens e everywhere. Um, I'm sure there's a few people in the room that have got uh, keys from maybe from previous roles to areas still that uh, maybe they should have given back. Um, this example. This actually came from an electricity provider, and this was actually a 132,000 volt distribution substation feeding Manchester Airport and uh, Christie's Hospital. Um, and they had a challenge where, and it was actually, this was, it was in the news, public uh, story, um, they actually found uh, a family, well, a, a lady and her children, young children, in a car park um, inside the compound of a 132,000 volt substation because it was conveniently placed for going to the supermarket um, and they were just using it because uh, a member of the family had worked within that, uh, that electricity substation, had retired, but had kept the keys. Um, they had other problems. They actually had a, a load of brass padlocks um, around their, their infrastructure. These padlocks have been in the field for 40, 50 years. Uh, Asarabloy padlocks, actually, nothing wrong with them. Uh, what they did find, though, is that every time they put these padlocks out, a couple of weeks later, they'd all gone missing again and they were actually being, the, the padlocks were being stolen. And, and sold for scrap because people had the keys and could just go around and collect up all of these padlocks, sell them for scrap. And so then again, you had these 11,000 up to 132,000 volt substations completely unsecured, um, which obviously became a major health and safety um, nightmare. So that's one example of what, you know, what, what can go wrong uh, with key control. 
Um, the safety, safety issues as well. So one of the, the problems that we have with a mechanical key is you don't really know who used it. You know who you gave it to, but you don't know that that person is still the, the, the holder of that key. You don't know that they haven't lent it to somebody else. Um, you don't know when they're using that key um, or, uh, or, or what they're doing with it. And in this scenario, again, another story that's in the news, uh, an explosion on a, a water treatment works. Um, and uh, unfortunately, in this case, there, there were a couple of fatalities. The explosion was so severe um, that it was impossible to identify um, who had actually been on the site uh, at the time through the, the, the evidence that was found of the victims uh, of that tragedy. And because it was a mechanical-based key system, they actually had no way of knowing. They didn't, they didn't definitely, they know who they thought was supposed to be on the site that day, um, but there was no way of telling exactly who could have been um, on the site that day. So safety and traceability um, is, is obviously important. Another one from an airport, this is actually uh, this is Gatwick Airport, where we did a, a system uh, about uh, 11 years ago now, uh, and their challenge was efficiency, their, their challenge was cost. So this was the engineering department, and, and airports are like small towns, they have their own utilities. Yeah, I'm sure they've got a significant amount of their own uh, communications infrastructure, but they also have their own water, they have their own energy, they, they have to be fairly self-sufficient, and they are effectively uh, a very um, sort of micro environment in terms of our critical infrastructure. And their engineering department had this challenge where, say, an electrical contractor, a London-based electrical contractor, so you know, not cheap, uh, comes to the, the airport to uh, fix, maybe there's a problem with one of the, the lifts um, over at uh, Airside, um, and they sign in with engineering, uh, and they get through and they have, they have to go through um, security in the same way that everybody else does um, because it's an airport, you know, it's, you're, you're entering international waters effectively by going over to, to Airside. So they go through all of the security barriers, all gates, get all their tools scanned, present the passport, 45 minutes on a good day to get through security at, at, uh, at a busy London airport and they get out to the, the lift that's got the problem and they discover that the issue is actually in a room backing onto that where they keep the batteries and the, um, and the, the electrical equipment and they don't have the key. Now they have to go back through security uh, to engineering because the engineering department is land side. They can't afford to have given this, this contractor a, a key to everywhere when they arrived at the airport because that would be a major security problem. You hand out these mechanical keys, you've got no way of getting them back, guaranteeing that you're going to get them back and obviously these keys could access uh, significant other areas of the airport as well. So they now have to go back through uh, another 45 minutes to go back through security, collect a key uh, from engineering um, and then another 45 minutes to go back through. So all in all, they're, learning, they're, they're losing a couple of hours of an expensive contractor's time before he's even been able to start doing uh, the work. But it's the only sensible way that they can maintain the security of these dispersed assets uh, across, again, a large geographical campus. And actually an airport, in comparison to some of the infrastructure, particularly communications infrastructure, an airport's tiny. It's, it's one problem, we spoke to, to one uh, a communications company a few years ago uh, that said they had 17,000 assets spread out all over uh, the UK um, and they had a, a, they, one of their issues was aborted site visits so contractor would turn up and they've hired a lifting equipment a cherry picker or something to, to do the work on the day and they've got to the site and they haven't got the correct key they can't get into the site they bought that visit and they've spent £300 hiring the cherry picker for the day they've got the cost of the contractor um, they gave us a number, and again, this is going back probably 10 years, um, they gave us a number of over a million pounds a year that they were spending on aborted site visits because of incorrect um, key control and uh, key management. And then more recently, um, and one maybe a little closer to home, um, so not picking on anyone here, so I guess it's an article that, uh, that we picked up recently, um, but it highlighted uh, a cyber security issue, a GDPR issue, um, through failure to properly know who had access uh, to parts of, of telecom infrastructure. Um, now, I think there were actually reasonable steps in place, but as with all things, um, if corners can, can be cut sometimes, they have to be cut sometimes for expedience. Uh, and in this case, it was picked up and it, it highlights a new compliance challenge around, again, a massively geographically dispersed infrastructure that you have to keep secure, but you do need to give loads of third party uh, contractors and people uh, potential access to. Um, and again, typically, to this point, controlled with uh, a mechanical key system. So, you're probably starting to see then that there is uh, a common problem uh, emerging um, in, in the, the world of, of infrastructure. Um, and this is a problem 
that, uh, that we actually started to address uh, from an asset alloy perspective right back at the turn of the millennium. Um, so there were a number of problems that started where we are now on our, our key evolution journey um, around uh, mechanical keys. And I'm going to take you through uh, a couple of those uh, problems. But first, um, I did say that uh, our marketing department do love a dramatic video. I do apologise. I've got no volume controls up here. So if I am about to deafen everyone, uh, I do, uh, do apologise. Um, just got a short video really to introduce, I uh, guess to start with the end in mind. Um, so this is what we're working towards. This is the world that we're now in. And then I'm going to take you through the journey that, uh, that helped us get there. that uh, there is a potentially a better way than uh, that great big bunch of keys that uh, I guess everybody uh, has been familiar with at uh, some stage. So on to the story of how we got there then. So innovation require, obviously requires a good idea. You can't, you can't start with a product with a, a bad idea. It's always fun looking around to find examples of uh, some of the worst uh, product ideas out there. This is a genuine product. Um, it does say Museum of Failure there in terms of, of innovation. But when Colgate, the, obviously the um, uh, cosmetics company, toothpaste company, decided that they needed to diversify, um, this was quite an interesting direction that they took in the 80s uh, to d diversify into uh, microwavable meals, which uh, are not... Uh, I guess it's the polar opposite of, of maybe trying to be good to your teeth, um, is, to, uh, is, is to, to eat sort of cheap microwave meals. But this is where they thought that they, um, I guess, something within their infrastructure, something within their supply chain, or something within, I guess, their route to market, um, certainly would be very similar. Their, their, sort of, their downward um, route to market would be very similar um, for supplying uh, goods into to supermarkets uh, and the like. Um, but innovation really, to be successful, does need to start off with a good, uh, a good idea. And, and as from a, a digitalization of physical security and, and keys perspective, I think did start off with a good idea because it started off with a problem to solve. Um, and that problem to solve is everything that we've just, we've just started off with. All of those case studies, all of those examples of what can go wrong with a mechanical key system, whether it's you don't know who's actually got the key anymore, um, you can't remember who you gave it to, um, you've, uh, you, you know that you've lost the key. Um, you know, lost keys are, are, are a major problem. Um, and we've got some good examples actually on a, in a few slides time um, on lost keys. Um, so and you, yeah, you need that traceability, you, you need that flexibility, you need everything that comes with the, the access control that you've put into the built environment, which we, we obviously want to try and achieve uh, an infrastructure. So our problem to solve, going back to, to the year 2000, uh, up in a penthouse in Scandinavia, Sweden somewhere, um, in Asarablo headquarters, uh, they were starting to look at a number of problems that were emerging for the future of mechanical keys, which at the time was very much the base of our business around the world. Um, it was mechanical key platforms, whether it's the Asa brand in Sweden, the Abloy brand in, in Finland, the Econ brand, brand in Germany, the Yale uh, brand in the, the UK, um, and the, the list goes on. All of them born out of a mechanical uh, key system. So if there was going to be a problem with this sector and mechanical keys were going to be chucked out and people were going to move to something else, we needed to absolutely make sure that we had uh, a, a big part to play in that, uh, in that product innovation cycle. So here's an interesting, another interesting statistic. Average person loses 3,000 possessions in their lifetime. Anybody want to hazard a guess as to how many umbrellas apparently, um, and uh, we do have the, uh, uh, the, the, um, 
the source of this, so we can share it to prove it, but any um, how many uh, umbrellas people might lose in a lifetime? It's quite an astounding number. That, well, I certainly couldn't believe it. 64, um, apparently. 64 umbrellas people might lose in their lifetime. Um, they lose uh, uh, several hundred uh, items of clothing, probably slightly more believable than the, the, the umbrellas. Um, pens is a, is a big one, um, sort of thousands of pens that people would lose in a lifetime. Number one lost item, though, um, keys. And when somebody loses their keys, when you lose your keys to your house or you lose your keys to your car, it's incredibly frustrating. Um, you know, it's always going to happen at the worst time. You lose your keys to the car, it's almost guaranteed to be on the day that you've got an important meeting um, and it's absolutely chucking it down with rain outside um, and, and it's, it's, it's going to be frustrating. But when you lose keys in a commercial or an infrastructure setting, it, it can be you know, extremely costly and extremely risky. Um, and you can see in the, the background, hopefully you can see in the background of the slide, some of the, uh, the different uh, articles, case studies we found on this uh, uh, over the years. Um, there's one, uh, Wembley Stadium, so a really good one. This was opening weekend um, of the London 2012 Olympic Games. Um, and it was actually uh, a member of Scotland Yard, a police officer, lost the master keys to Wembley Stadium. And a locksmith in London made a considerable amount of money that weekend. Um, unfortunately, not with Asa Bavloy Keys, I will add, but um, re-keying at Wembley Stadium. So that was quite a, quite a, a big one there. Um, the prison one, it's another UK uh, example. 1.3 million pounds worth of cost uh, to the Ministry of Justice for a set of keys that went missing for four hours. Um, they were found again, um, and they were found inside the prison. But because they had been unaccounted for for a four-hour period, and they could have been duplicated, and obviously uh, if there's one area that organised crime is interested in uh, gaining access to, it's within the Ministry of Justice and the prison system, uh, they just can't take that risk. Um, so £1.3 million pounds worth of, of cost. Now, fortunately, that is an asset alloy product. Chublock's Custodial Services did very well out of uh, uh, resweeting um, that, uh, that prison. Um, the worst one in some ways for me on here, fortunately not a UK uh, example, is the, the loss of keys to a nuclear laboratory. Um, this was in, uh, in North America. Um, and again, several million pounds worth of, uh, of risk uh, and cost associated with uh, the, the loss of those keys. So keys are going missing all the time. Um, and in a lot of, a lot of big infrastructure customers, um, they've had key systems that have been out there for a long, long time. Um, because it's, it's, so, it's so difficult, so challenging to even contemplate changing the keys. When you think about the number of people that may have keys to, to some of the assets that you, you guys use within your uh, space out there, the, the number becomes uh, absolutely astronomic. Um, and so in a lot of cases, those lost keys, um, it's, it's acceptable to, to bear the risk. And it's only when something does happen that then uh, the pressure starts to, to obviously start to resolve uh, that problem. So we had a problem, which is the frustration with mechanical keys and people not, uh, uh, not wanting to, to, to have the risk uh, of a lost key. Um, so we had that problem to solve. Uh, there are other problems though. You know, sometimes innovation can be incredibly disruptive. We, in fact, we're, we're here today with a, a room full of people that have just spent uh, decades disrupting um, the, the world, I guess, in terms of um, the innovations around uh, broadband internet and obviously all of the good that it's brought. But here's an example of where it uh, was incredibly disruptive to a particular industry um, over a period of time. And the thing that we're picking on here particularly is copyright protection and copyright protection within the, the media space. And, uh, you know, look, we're not in the media space. I'm not here to... to you have to explain that to the young people, I think. Okay, yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, peer-to-peer -peer sharing, uh, being able to download and pirate uh, movies and, uh, and music, was the risk for this particular industry, so for the media uh, industry, that came with the, the rollout of, uh, of, of broadband internet access to um, the internet for, for the masses, certainly at a reasonable speed. Um, now, this statistic's a few years old, um, but the devaluation within the music and media industry um, was, uh, was 50%, because only, you know, there, 2022, only 11% of, uh, of music that's listened to is now owned by the listener. Um, whereas you, you roll back to the pre-broadband days, everybody would have gone go down to HMV and, and you know, a single's going to cost you 3 99 or go back even further than that. Um, and uh, you know, maybe it's on, on, on tapes and cassettes and things. Um, but people used to own the, 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 the media asset. And now they don't, they rent it. Now that's fantastic, it's been hugely uh, beneficial 
to the consumer um, in terms of, of cost, um, in terms of convenience, in terms of access. But it did pose, as a, as a technology disruption, it did immediately pose an overnight threat to copyright, which was an internationally recognized uh, intellectual property protection uh, asset or, or standard. Um, and uh, the, the reason we wanted to highlight it, so we don't we don't copyright a key system. You can't, you know, you can, you can trademark the name of it, but you can't uh, you can't copyright a key system. But what you can do, since the late 90s, since uh, there was a challenge by uh, GSF, the, the car parts manufacturer, on on copywriting of, of spare parts, you can patent um, a key system. You can patent a design of a mechanical key and a locking technology. Uh, and the reason that's important is then so that you can stop duplication of keys um, out there in the, the market. You can't take an abloy key, for example, to uh, a local heel bar and get a key duplicated. You have to take it to an authorised abloy distributor um, who has access to our patent protected key blades. Um, and that has been the way that infrastructure in particular has been secured from a mechanical key system for decades. You know, it's, that's the way that it's worked. Um, now there are there are other utility um, and, and infrastructure customers, uh, maybe more mature. So water, for example, I mean water's been around forever. Um, so uh, the water uh, as an infrastructure sector, they have specific groups that get together and write the standards of exactly what type of locking technologies they can have on certain assets within their infrastructure. And patent is their their absolute holy grail in terms of uh, that mechanical uh, key system. But if a disruptive technology like broadband internet can impact copyright protection on a global scale almost overnight. Uh, what can something like 3D printing do to the patent? Now, you can't just download a copy of anything off the internet and 3D print it at home. You know, certainly complex designs and things are, are a little bit more challenging. But you know, I've been doing this type of presentation for 15 years. And 15 years ago, I went into an Asda store um, in Watford. And there was this great big white room sort of next to uh, the photo printing area. Uh, no idea what it's for, went over there. You went inside and it took a scan of you. And then while you did your grocery shopping, it 3D printed a little model. I have no idea why anybody would want to do this, but it 3D print a little model of you out while you did your shopping. Um, it was 125 pound, um, but it was, it was there. I don't know if it was a proof of concept, but that was 15 years ago. And that was in a it, sort of consumer space. And this technology is moving on and on and on and on and on all the time. Um, and realistically, we are in an age, we're absolutely at a point where I could take a photo of somebody's key. I mean, cameras, even the cameras on people's phones these days are good enough to take a photo, a high definition photo of a key from the other side of a room, take it home, run it through some software, 3D print a model of that key. And there's nothing that the patent can do to protect you from that. And we were aware of this. We were aware of this at, at, at Abloy, at Asa Abloy, that firstly, people don't want the mechanical key system to be the future uh, of their security. They do want the stuff that they can see happening in the access control world. Around the, the, the turn of the millennium then, we had uh, the Magstripe card technology, um, actually the Magstripe card technology starting to phase out in favor of, of proximity technology. And in the built environment, we were starting to see things like the automatic speed gates and turnstiles, uh, anti-pass back and, and things coming through in access control. We were starting to be able to really control the movement of people in, in the built environment. and our infrastructure customers expect the same. Um, why can't we have that? Why can't we have um, a, a credential that, that we can turn off when somebody doesn't need it, or at least only works for the hours of the day that we need it to? Why can't we have a credential that on one day can open this set of locks and on another day can open this set of locks flexibly without us having to hand out multiple keys so that we don't have to have that great big bunch of keys that everybody's uh, familiar with? And that was the innovation journey that we started. Um, for us, that solution really came uh, uh, into the, certainly into the UK market around about 2011. So the click technology for Mass Rabloy <coughs> is the idea of placing electronics over a conventional mechanical key. And why this is important in terms of the key evolution journey? Well, it, you, know, you guys are in a very disruptive field, so uh, you're working on, on technology that's new to people all the time. But Who's going to be the first person to, to get on a commercial airline that completely flies by itself? Um, now that's going to be quite an alien thing. It's going to be, you're going to feel quite stressed doing that if you want to be the first person that takes that technology on. But as soon as we get to that point, 
you add 50 years onto that, and it will be the norm. Um, and everyone will be quite comfortable. But you can't just jump into something completely different and radical, that particularly in something as important as protecting critical infrastructure, because there's standards there that have been built up over, over time, over decades. There's working practices, there's ways of doing things. So you can't just suddenly say, now we're going to chuck all your keys away and everything's going to work on biometrics, because people aren't going to trust it. They're not going to know how to use it. Um, they want just something they're familiar with. And bear in mind, this is also about keeping operations running. You can't just jump to a new and complex technology. You need a path to take you there. And so putting the, the electronics over the top of the key meant that to the user, it's still just a key. Um, and that was uh, fundamentally uh, important. So uh, just to uh, give you a break from my voice, we've got another little video from Abdul here to explain the, uh, the ProTip2 click uh, technology. Company security is much more than locking the doors at the end of the day. Managing the different security levels of facilities and resources and the flexibility to adapt employees' access requirements to several sites in different locations is not only part of a company's security, it also improves operational efficiency. What if you could combine all your doors, locks and their users into one easy-to-manage system where they only need one key? Designed for medium and large business needs, Protect 2 Click is a locking and access management solution that combines robust mechanical locking and electronic control in a unique way. Featuring time specific individual access rights, authorized people can always access the right place at the right time. No matter how many locations, doors, locks, and employees your company has, one key is enough to open all the doors needed. If your employees' travel needs change, they can be amended from anywhere at any time using a remotely managed system. You can also reduce risk from stolen or lost keys, as Protect 2 Click keys can be disabled and replaced whenever necessary. Because key usage is stored in the key's audit log, you are up to date on who has visited the premises and when. At the same time, you get valuable information for resource management. While the system solves many challenges, it does not have to be complicated. Together, the reliable Protect2 and the intelligent Click system make everyday life easy for the user and the administrator. It is future-proofed, so it can be integrated with your current and future systems. Protect2 Click is a unique combination of modern technology, flexible management, and dual authentication security for your business today and in the future. Okay, so that saved me going through the, 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 the Protect2 Click side of things, because that's actually not the technology we're specifically um, here to, to talk to you about today. But the reason that it's important is that it's, it's part of the journey, it's part of that key evolution. You can't take that, that big step into that, um, that, that new, uh, something completely different. You do need to gradually move uh, on a digitalization journey, particularly, as I say, when it's something uh, such as infrastructure. The, the reason that the, the Click product was so successful, and it's it's a, this is Asababu's most successful product globally, um, uh, and has been for the last ten years, um, and the reason it's it's so successful is because it just incrementally builds on what's already there. There's already a standard, an international European standard for padlock grade security. There's already one for cylinder security. Uh, there's attack testing. The UK government know how to, to test uh, and authorise um, product for their catalogue of security equipment based on uh, mechanical platforms and, and physical security protection. So we can build on top of all of those things because it's still a mechanical padlock, it's just got a slight bit of electronics in it, it's got the electronics uh, and that added value um, on the, the, the key system. So it's an important step for us and that's a step, as I say, we took that step in 2011 um, and uh, rolled it out across um, uh, various different uh, UK infrastructure, also uh, you know, some residential properties and all kinds of other sectors as well. Healthcare has been a big market for drug storage, um, so it's, uh, it's also something that you can easily install um, in, uh, in any location because there's no power source, there's no, there's no cabling, there's no connectivity to do it. So, where do we go next from there? So the, the, the key evolution uh, doesn't stop there. Um, the, the next technology um, is then how do we get rid of that key altogether? 
um, because you know sometimes less does equal more, um, and, and ultimately, if you don't have still don't and, and Click had that one problem that still existed, that you still have to get the credential to the person. So in that scenario that you've turned up, you're a third party contractor, and you've, you've driven 30 miles to, to work on a particular site on a particular day, and you find that you don't have access, if you now need to get a key, you still have a problem. You've still got to go somewhere and get that key. You've got to drive the 30 miles back uh, to pick it up, or somebody's got to come out uh, to that site and let you in. Um, so the, the key is still, uh, still a challenge. Um, there's other issues with the key. You still can't stop somebody lending a key to somebody else. There's a few things we've tried to do, such as dual factor authentication uh, in the system, but ultimately if somebody wants to lend their key to somebody, um, they can still do that. So it doesn't necessarily, uh, as long as that person's still got authorised access, doesn't necessarily stop that unauthorised access to site to maybe borrow a car park so that you can uh, do your convenient uh, food shopping. the last dramatic video I promise out of the, uh, you can see they've got a bit of a flair for this in our marketing department out in, uh, in Finland um, so Abloy Beat is the name of the technology and this is this is our latest uh, locking solution um, this is a product we introduced 2021 um, in just a padlock form uh, and that uh, padlock uh, is, is what we're best known for globally and it is our number one uh, selling solution into the infrastructure space but we're growing this portfolio all the time and I'm going to show you some of the examples uh, of that but it is from our perspective it's still a key and we want to treat it like a key it's part of that key evolution you still need to give somebody access you still need to make that decision um, and the, 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 the piece where we sit is right in the middle of, um, of, of who needs access and what did they do when they got there what we're doing is we're just providing that, that, that blocker we will either let them in or we won't based on what um, you as a, as a customer has decided that they need to have access uh, access to. But we're starting to branch out into both. Um, we're giving a way for our solution to be involved in the what comes first, so the compliance engines um, and the access control and the, pro the business processes, the workflows that already exist. Um, and we're starting to branch out into the what comes after, so just giving data for analytics so that you can start to look at uh, patterns of, of access um, that, that people are doing uh, to detect problems um, before they become uh, bigger problems. So BEAT is a, a mobile credential. Um, it's, uh, it's easy to use. It's powered by, uh, and I uh, apologise, I have nowhere near as many acronyms as the, the previous presentation. Obviously, the security industry doesn't have anywhere near as many acronyms as the, the telecom space uh, does. So, uh, it's but uh, it's powered by uh, CIOS, which is a, an ASR Abloy um, technology based on uh, public key infrastructure, so it's a, a high security uh, encrypted communication. And then you get that full traceability. So if we go back to where we were right at the beginning of the presentation, you have mechanical keys, mechanical keys, great big bunches causing all kinds of problems for, for flexibility. We've moved through the digitalization of still having keys, and now we're in this space where you can be anywhere uh, come across a, uh, a locking point that you need access to, request access um, through your, your mobile device and have access granted instantly and a credential delivered to you instantly uh, anywhere in the world. Just uh, in terms of a, a bit of the, the, the detail um, on it, um, it is, so from this the CIOS perspective, this is um, uh, in the, the access control space and for those of you that are uh, sort of linked to uh, security, you probably recognise CIOS. CIOS was developed by one, one of the Aceraboloid, biggest Aceraboloid companies, a company called HID. And HID do uh, all of the things like electronic passports, um, identity management, uh, the, the biggest uh, credential and, and reader provider um, out there in the world. So they've grown up in this electronic security space um, uh, as part of our, our group. They developed this, uh, this card technology, this encryption technology that allows you to store information within the credential as, as well as everything else. Um, and we've embedded that into uh, our Beat solution at, at Abloy, 
Um, firstly, because it's obviously convenient for us to use technologies that are um, from within our own group, but because it's recognised as, as an industry uh, best practice uh, and a high security uh, encryption. Um, and then it's, it, it's our first API first product. Uh, and that's a really exciting um, statement to be able to make from, from me in particular as, as head of technology and, and head of digital, um, because it means it's our first product that we've built. And I guess recognizing that we're, we're probably not gonna build the best software out there. Um, we're probably not gonna build the best analytics engine. We're probably not gonna build the best uh, permit to work or compliance engine that might work for all the different uh, sectors and spaces that we work in. But we will build the best locks. Um, and if we build them API first, then it means that others that are already providing you really good analytics and business intelligence solutions can easily consume data generated uh, within that, uh, that B solution. Uh, others that are providing permit to work um, and asset management solutions uh, that specialize in that space can easily um, uh, issue credentials and enroll product um, into, into that particular asset and manage the, the infrastructure because that's what uh, they're good at. And then we focus on the bit that we're really good at uh, from, from an Abloy perspective. So in terms of how it works, um, we can, so we do have, we have our, our site manager, um, which I'm not going to go into uh, uh, detail on uh, uh, today. We have our, our own software for managing assets and things. But as I say, the, the bit that we're really good at is, is the, the locking product. So the locking product and the credential uh, is powered by our API uh, backend, and I do wish there was a better way of putting it in backend, but that's what it's, uh, it's called from a, a cloud software as a service um, uh, perspective. Um, and then any software solution can be integrated into that, can leverage that to issue a credential. Credential turns up um, on your, your smartphone, um, on your, your Beat app, or third-party apps. There's a full SDK. Uh, for our app that's developed as well. So that the credential can actually be embedded inside, again, existing workflow tools that exist um, within your industry um, that are, are, are used. Um, and you can gain access to that piece of hardware um, locking that particular uh, locking point, whether that's a padlock or a uh, controller for electric locking devices, um, a swing handle for, for, for street furniture, um, or uh, we do a key deposit as well if uh, we do need to manage um, individual keys. So here, here's an example. Um, so this is a, a, a telecom workforce management type solution. Hopefully um, this is uh, something, a challenge that I guess you would, uh, you would recognize. Um, but you've got uh, uh, maybe workforce ERP um, planning software that's saying, okay, we've got all of these people, we've got these assets in our HR system. You've maybe got a compliance database or a compliance um, a way of checking, somebody saying, oh, I need access to, to one of these uh, particular assets to do something, um, then you check, okay, do they have the right qualifications? Is it, yeah, maybe it's loan working, working from height, um, confined space working, do they have whatever they need to be able to work in that? Uh, do, you, do you have a question? I do. Oh, go ahead. Sorry for interrupting. Remote workers activate access rights in the big mobile application. Yep. Once the phone, smartphone, is activated, does it still have to maintain communication with anything, or can you be out of signal up a mountain? Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic question, because actually, it's, yeah, it's, it's a really important part of the system. It's offline. So once you have the credential, which you could get at the beginning of the day, you know, in the comfort of your home, or um, when you, you've got a, a guaranteed connection, once you have your key on your phone, it, it doesn't need access to, to anything. It's, yeah, a, it's, Bluetooth, a, it's a Bluetooth, Bluetooth low energy connection between the phone and the, the locking device. So yeah, so once you've downloaded your accesses, you could download accesses for a week. Um, and that's your schedule, that's, your, that's the work you're doing. If you then need to make a change, yeah, of course you need to get somewhere that's got connectivity. Um, and as soon as you do go somewhere with connectivity and you have the, the Beat app open, or the third party app if it's been integrated, all of the audit information that's in the phone will be pushed up. Um, to, to that uh, uh, software as a service uh, cloud as well. So that again, either our software or your third party analytics software can get the benefit of, uh, of that data. So uh, at the moment, I guess it is multiple different pieces of software working in different ways uh, that eventually says, okay, we have a problem or we have a maintenance need or we have a third party that needs to gain access to this piece of uh, telecoms infrastructure for whatever reasons they do. Um, and you've checked your compliance uh, database, and you've now got to say, right, okay, we've got to find the key, and we've got to find the mechanical key, or we've got to find somebody that can go to site um, as an attended visit 
and, and let that person have access um, to that particular piece of infrastructure. So those multiple pieces of software could all come together, um, can all be integrated, uh, and ultimately our solution is saying, have you checked that they've got the right compliance? Has that been done? Um, are they available to work right now? Has that been done? And then it's just saying, okay, all of that's been done, therefore send this mobile number an invitation uh, to be if they've never used the system before. They download the app. Um, we get uh, a call back to say they've downloaded the app and they've activated it, great, here's their credential, off they go. Um, and then you'll get all that audit trail uh, information uh, thereafter. So it is about, it's about convenience, it's about efficiency, which going back uh, to earlier in the slides, ultimately you have to have a problem to solve. Um, and uh, I think I'm, uh, I'm pretty much at the end now. So um, just in terms of uh, finishing off, um, as I say, we do have our, our telecoms experts here in the, the form of Rob and, and Cassie, so do, do make sure if you have some specific uh, questions about how it could work, um, you, you reach out to those guys or ask, ask questions in a minute. But ultimately, um, I wanted to finish on this, our, our Keyless Swing handle. Um, this is the latest product to bring into the range. Um, so this is designed uh, as a vandal resistant IP rated uh, unit for, for, for street furniture. Um, so this, this is powered uh, by itself, it's got a, a battery uh, within it. Um, you turn up, you push the button to wake it up, uh, and if you've got the credential on the phone, you can gain access uh, to that particular uh, piece of equipment. So from a key evolution perspective, uh, you get less keys, but you get more security, more sustainability, more traceability, and uh, more efficiency. And that's Abloy. Where are these awkward questions? I don't know. What are these real questions? So I, I have a question. Uh, yeah. Any any intent or plan to extend it to actual like vehicle emissions? Because obviously uh, that's another key issue. Yeah. So actually, uh, it's interesting. We've 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 done a few example projects of that over the years. So we did a, um, with uh, one of the, the harbours, um, one of the ports, we did a, uh, that was crane ignition, because they were finding people were just using these cranes to offload, offload boats in the middle of the night. Um, there's a number of ways you can do it. It is ultimately a key switch. What we would always be careful of with vehicles is um, there's a warranty issue, obviously, if you start really tampering around with the, the ignition circuit within a vehicle. We do, within the, um, the, the BEAT ecosystem, we do a, a controller. Um, which can run off the 12 volt vehicle supply or 24 volt vehicle supply depending on whether it's HDV um, that could be used as part of the ignition circuit but we would try and take as kind of a hands-off approach as possible from an abloy perspective because you need that vehicle OEM to be involved from a warranty but yeah it's, it's been done um, it's just slightly more complicated thanks a lot for the video the fans make great videos they do yeah really interesting um, you know, I think you know, telecom audience here, uh, rolling out different types of technology like this, um, usually what you're up against is getting into the operator's OSS systems, their operating systems. Do you have experience in the telecom space rolling that out? Uh, what have you experienced? Because usually getting into someone else's system is the hardest part of rolling out a big deployment of anything. I'm yeah. guessing controllable locks would be in that category. Yeah, and actually, that's not in any way unique to, to, to telecoms. You know, in terms of infrastructure, I think what we've done over the, the years with the, the click technology and now uh, more later with the beat technology, um, I think one of our biggest frustrations is that we've put these systems in and they've been managed very much by our ASM Abloy softwares because we haven't been able to completely get in with those business processes, you're absolutely right. So they've solved a problem um, that was, becomes an immediate problem. Um, so we've, we've put a, an electronic key system somewhere because somebody's had a, uh, a particular theft or fatality or, or a significant risk through an audit or something. Um, and they've solved the problem and then they haven't necessarily taken the product further by integrating it in. And that's one of the things that we, yeah, we have recognized. Um, and it's why we have vertical specialists now that are not just responsible for the customers, but also responsible for the other players that are providing solutions to those customers. And it's why the product is API first, so that it's, it will be, you know, the idea is it's, it's part of your service now offering, it's part of your remedy offering, whatever those, those, those um, 
uh, ticketing systems that might be deployed after those operational things. But it is a challenge, you're absolutely right. We have solutions. I think the, the easiest way often is to just put a small system in somewhere. So we encourage every customer to start with, to start with two or three locks and just play around with it to see how it would work. And then think about what your blue sky is, what your begin with the end in mind is, because at least then you can architect it properly to, to fit into your processes. But it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a challenge we're working on. Uh, yeah. Hello, I've got the microphone. Um, I didn't hear much about biometrics. Is it not seen as a viable? It's, well, it's not really, actually, from a, from a UK market perspective. So biometrics is um, from a, a, a the built environment. And firstly, biometrics in the field is a disaster. Um, you, know, you, you put biometrics in, in, into operational assets out there, you know, whether it's a water, energy, telecom site. Somebody turns up, inevitably got gloves on uh, every single time, in the, in, so certainly in the winter. Um, you try to use facial recognition, it doesn't work because you've got the sun behind you or, or something like that. Facial recognition and, and sun biometrics is, is getting very big in the, uh, the built environment in certainly Eastern Europe, Middle East, um, big, big markets for it, and we do a lot uh, with it. But it wouldn't be within our, our critical infrastructure team because it's, no, it's, it's not something that we're seeing is, um, is, is, in, is in demand. You know, the reality is, um, people are carrying around uh, a computer in their pockets more advanced than most access control controllers that you'd install on the wall of a building. And so if you can leverage that, if that has biometrics in it, so you're using the face ID or something, then you still have that ability to verify the individual. We as a manufacturer don't have to get involved in the, the GDPR and privacy of it, um, but also it doesn't have those challenges, as I say, that you, you have in, uh, in that infrastructure environment. So it's, it, it, for us, I think the smartphone seems to be the, that's what people, certainly the one thing I can tell you that everybody says is, I don't want keys. Um, and it, you know, as, as long as our solution doesn't, is a step on from having keys, then that's, that's solving the problem. Good, there's lots of questions, it's good. The lot you showed. Yeah. Uh, you said battery power. Yes. How long does the battery life? Uh, it's always hard to say how long a battery lasts. We, the expected battery life and the, the Abloy tested battery life in the, the LOX is five years. Um, that's based on 5,000 operations. It, if you put it in a high use environment, um, obviously you're going to change batteries more frequently. You do get battery status reported back though uh, through, the, through the app and through the API. Um, so it does just become part of that, uh, that maintenance cycle. Um, and you can change that battery in the field. So the, uh, the, the, the padlock, for example, um, if you have access, you can boost it open with a USB-C connector uh, if the battery's out, and then you can just undo it with an Allen key, change the battery if you've got authorised access to the padlock. So it has to be a, a, a correct credential holder that can do it. Um, but it's a standard battery you can change in the field. Hi, I'm just interested in kind of around the health and safety concerns about the fail-safe of the Beats lock. For example, if um, if the beast lock actually closes automatically once the person enters the building, is, is, is there a way out? Uh, yeah, so it, depending on the building, um, you would be, I mean, first and foremost, you'd have emergency escape standards, uh, EM 179, 1125 for panic or emergency escape that you'd have to comply to anyway. So in that case, we wouldn't use necessarily, we wouldn't necessarily put a padlock on it. You'd put um, uh, the controller, which is the, the, the BLE controller, that can then control an uh, electric lock, um, uh, which is on a lever handle or panic bar if that's the requirements of that particular uh, location. So you, you have to meet the requirements of, of, the, of the door of the area. Um, there are actually ways you can, there are solutions out there where you can use a padlock um, and you can have a breakout handle on the inside. Um, it's uh, they're quite clever mechanisms with a, with a hasp. Um, but yeah, and that's, it is really important that you understand the, you know, what are the compliance requirements of the site. So for this room, for example, we have a, a requirement to have an emergency escape. Um, we wouldn't be able to you know, put padlock on that door uh, over there. Uh, so yeah, you do need to know. Yeah, I was more interested in the fact that, for example, as some members of a, a, a room, and um, battery dries on the phone when I can't use it. Yeah, so I get so what you would do there is you'd use uh, you'd use the controller, 
um, and then you'd use an electric lock that had solenoid control from the outside. So your access controls on the outside, you, you have to have the right credential to get in, but it's single mechanical means of egress from the inside. And that's your EM179, that's your emergency egress. Uh, I was going to ask the same question about batteries, but I'll ask a different one. Got it. Um, <coughs> I can see how you secure the link from the phone to your service, but what do you do over the Bluetooth link? Is that just so uh, yeah, CEOS all the way through. So it's C the CEOS technology uh, from, from, from HID, which is based on, on a public key infrastructure, uh, that is end to end. So that, that credential, um, it, the, that those keys are embedded. So when you enroll um, any beat lock into your tenancy uh, with, within the beat ecosystem, um, it gets that um, that certificate, that part of that trust chain, um, that, that public key infrastructure. Um, so that credential that's passed through the phone um, has to be part of that chain. Um, it's not the phone doesn't need to decrypt it and do anything with it. The phone doesn't know. The phone is just passing a secured credential. Um, and it's the same way that mobile credentials work uh, across the access control ecosystem. The mobile phone doesn't have any uh, useful information on it whatsoever. It's just passing. Uh, the encrypted credential that it's being given uh, across that BLE. So you, yeah, we, you should never, ever trust anybody, anybody's protocols. You know, don't trust BLE, don't trust HTTPS, don't trust any. You always have your own method of, of obviously having that encryption within there as well, particularly uh, within security. Any other questions? No? What the hook? Well, uh, uh, guys, if you do have questions, as I say, you know, do, do see my colleagues and see us uh, in, uh, in one of the breaks. Thank you.